Welcome back to another episode of ANCAP Radio with me, your host, Chase Rachels. Now, today we have a really cool topic. It's one of my personal favorites. It's entitled Against Left Libertarianism, an Anarcho-Capitalist Critique. Now, some more good news. I've also recently been invited to the Being Libertarian media team. You may be aware of their Facebook page. It has nearly a quarter million likes and followers. So that's definitely sure to help spread the message to a much wider audience. So really exciting stuff. Now before we dive into the meat and potatoes of the critique, I want to lay some groundwork first, starting off with the scope of political philosophy. Now, political philosophy is basically developed to solve the fundamental social problem, which has to do with the fact that we live in a world with scarce resources which simply means that we there are resources which there's only a finite amount of them and the demand for them exceeds their availability so in order to avoid a chaotic might makes right paradigm in the world people decided to develop political philosophies and property norms to help deconflict these mutually exclusive desires for how to employ such scarce goods now, property norms simply are those rules which inform us as to who owns what. Otherwise, who has a proper claim, who has a greater claim to determine how a certain resource is used, occupied, or employed than someone else. Now, when we say that someone owns something or that he has a right to something, all this simply means is that he is justified in defending this own good or property with force or in seeking retribution via force for its violation. So if you really want to boil it down to one question, the scope of political philosophy is confined to the simple question of when is the use of force justified. It's really that simple. That's all that it's really about is determining when is the use of force justified. Everything else falls outside of the scope of political philosophy. Now this will be pertinent to the rest of the discussion here because it will kind of inform you as to why uh, left libertarians make an error when they attempt to stuff non-enforceable preferences into a political philosophy which is expressly meant to answer that one fundamental question about force okay now one last piece of groundwork i want to define what the anarcho-capitalist flavor of libertarianism is so that we can kind of compare and contrast uh, anarcho-capitalism and left libertarianism this might be helpful for some of you now anarcho-capitalism is based on the private property ethic that's the most uh core that's its core foundation and what this ethic states is that any scarce good and all scarce goods are subject to private ownership given that they are acquired via original appropriation, also known as homesteading or the first user rule, or voluntary exchange. Now the reason why these two acquisition methods were chosen is because they are inherently conflict free. If you're the first person to come by a, a, a good in nature that's previously unowned and you transform it in some way or you possess it in some way, you do something to it which creates a superior, objectively verifiable link between yourself and that good in question, then this is inherently a conflict free act. And you're able to demonstrate the fact that you have a superior claim to this good which is helpful in future cases in case someone else tries to take it later and it's under dispute who actually owns it. I don't want to get too far in the weeds there. Suffice it to say, it's conflict free, so it's A-OK. -okay. Um, voluntary exchange, the same deal. Uh, if someone gives you something of theirs, of their own will, or if they trade it to you for something else, the title to it, then that's yours. You know. Uh, this is also conflict free and this is why it's one of those two acquisition methods. If you want to get further into the weeds into these more fundamental principles, it's really interesting and it gets a little bit uh, abstract, 
but you're more than welcome to pick up a copy of my book or even see a free PDF version online. Check out chapter one entitled Libertarianism and I provide a rational justification showing why these two methods of property acquisition are sound and why only the private property ethic is suitable towards uh, mitigating or eliminating interpersonal violence, promoting cooperation, and maximizing uh, economic prosperity. So let's move on. Now, this is the last piece of groundwork I want to get into before getting into left libertarianism specifically. I want to go over some of the common rhetorical tactics that you'll see a lot of left libertarians engage in. Now, of course, these aren't necessarily inherent to left libertarianism or left libertarians, but they're very common, and you'll, you'll find them a lot when you're trying to communicate with these people. So I want to kind of prepare you for what you're about to encounter so you don't get kind of bamboozled or confused when talking with these people. Uh, one of their biggest things they like to do is equivocate. Uh, this basically means they like to use words where they can kind of hedge their meetings, where they, where they have multiple senses of meetings that they can be interpreted in many different ways, sometimes even mutually exclusive ways. And the reason they use such language is, is twofold. First, uh, it helps them avert any attempt at their critique. Because if someone criticizes one interpretation that you probably were meaning, you can just claim you were using a different interpretation of the word. And the other reason is because when a word has so many different, uh, when it's very fluid, a term is, when it's very fluid and it can be interpreted in many different ways, well, it's easier for people to kind of project their own desired interpretation upon it, which makes the philosophy more palatable to more people, more appealing, I should say. So when you hear left libertarian speak or write, they're usually writing a lot more so for the connotative effect, for the feelings that their language evokes as opposed to the denotative or distinguishable meanings. Uh, more denotative language is probably going to be more common with very logical, rationally based people. Uh, not to sound biased, but it's going to be a lot more common in the uh, ANCAP community uh, than it will be in the left libertarian community. Now, some favorites they have, equivocating terms they like to use, could include things like uh, oppression, exploitation, uh, like, for instance, they might use exploitation as being interchangeable with aggression, in which case most ANCAPs can and should agree with the way they oppose exploitation, if that's what they're using it uh, for, as a, a substitute for aggression. Or they can use it more broadly to, to include other things like wage labor and things like that. And this is where we start to deviate. That's why you need to be very careful and have these guys pin down exactly what they mean by these terms. Uh, another one is social justice, and then there's also equality. Now again, anarcho-capitalists and libertarians, we only believe in equality in the most narrow sense, which is that everyone should be afforded the same negative private property rights. That everyone should have the NAP applying to them, as well as the principle of self-ownership. Um, Again, I don't know if I mentioned it before, but self-ownership just means that you have the ex you're the exclusive owner of your own physical body, and that unlike for external goods, this is not one ownership that can be transferred. If you want to get more into the details as to why that is, check out Chapter 3 of the same book I mentioned before, A Spontaneous Order and Contracts. I go into more depth as to the differences, but we'll save that for another talk. For now, let's just stick to the, uh, the topic at hand. So again, look out for words like oppression, exploitation, social justice, equality, solidarity, uh, sexual liberation, you know, anything that kind of has an obscure meaning but evokes feeling to people, and be very careful. And whenever you can, try to get these guys to concretely define their words. And what you'll find, which is what I found, is that almost every time they attempt to define them, they'll use other vague obscure terms and what's even more ironic and kind of comical is that you ask 10 left libertarians how to define one of these words and you'll get 15 different answers <laughs> so anyways uh, another favorite of theirs is the Mott and Bailey tactic 
Uh, I put on the left side hand of the picture here shows the form of this tactic. It's very similar to the equivocation thing. And I'll give an example. Uh, for instance, a person like Kevin Carson, he's a notable left libertarian figure. He's actually used this one before. He says, oh, well, capitalists want to privatize their profits but socialize their losses. So, in the case of the bailouts, he'll say, yeah, the capitalists love this. They love to socialize their cost. Okay, but you see, the, the, the issue here is that there's two different meanings of capitalists. A capitalist could either be A, an owner of capital, which is the interpretation he's using, but a capitalist in the context of political philosophy is someone who subscribes to the uh, economic system of capitalism. They think that is the best system for maximizing uh, economic prosperity. And a capitalist in this sense would be totally opposed to any socialization of profits or losses whatsoever because so socialization of anything always entails some degree of private property violations at least when the state is doing it, which in the case that Kevin Carson critiques it, it most certainly is. So you can look at the form that Mott and Bailey tactics take themselves on the left here. The Mott, the Mott is the more defensible position, the Bailey is the, is the one that's more controversial and harder to, to defend. So again, like if you, if you called Kevin Carson out in the capitalist uh, example, you say, no, I, I mean like a capitalist as in somebody who's like, like a Warren Buffett or a George Soros, like a capitalist. Like, okay, guy, yeah, we know you didn't really mean it like that, but, you know, so be it. They'll never admit to that. Anyways, uh, moving on, uh, another favorite of theirs is the appeal to tradition. Like, for instance, the reason they call themselves left, they'll say to people who are more of the capitalist bent, who are more into the contemporary uh, libertarianism that's from America, one that's more pro-capitalist, pro-private property, etc. They'll say, well, hey, Friedrich Bastiat, he sat on the left side of the French legislature in the 1800s, and this is where the left comes from. And again, first of all, that doesn't mean that calling yourselves left today is good, because left has a new meaning today than it did in the French legislature back in 1800s. Because if people like capitalists like Bastiat sat on the left, then that means it's something a little different than it is today when the left is explicitly uh, very hostile towards capitalism, right? Um, and finally, the idea is that they'll say this, but in reality, they're very anti-capitalist, and they're very much more... Uh, uh, friendly towards socialist type of ideas and these are traditionally left things and when they say they're left libertarians they might tell you as a free market person that hey Bastiat but in reality they're just trying to appeal to other contemporary lefties who are socialists and social justice warriors and the such um, and again finally there's straw mans and I'll give some more examples of these as I go on I just want to kind of fill you in on different rhetorical tactics now, what is left libertarianism? Well, as you know, as we just talked about, these guys like to use a lot of equivocating language. So it's really hard to pin down concretely exactly what left libertarianism is, but I'll tell you guys some very compositions that these people take. Now, they ultimately, or at least almost all of them, they want to push forward additional extra social commitments beyond private property and the NAP. These can include an opposition to racism, sexism, transphobia, homophobia, Islamophobia, all the phobias you can freaking think of. It can include opposition to hierarchies in general or hierarchical workplaces, such as like corporations, things like that. It could include an opposition to landlord lease relationships. They might be against rent if they're more mutualist leaning. They could be against interest bearing loans. Um, basically, the biggest thing when it comes to left libertarianism, the biggest difference is they're really focusing on egalitarianism as a virtue in itself, right? And there are two issues with this. One, if they're a more, I would say, virtuous left libertarian, they might say, well, yes, we're opposed to all these cultural 
behaviors that we think that are bad for society. They might be nonviolent, but we still op oppose them. However, we're not willing to enforce them with violence. We don't think that they, they can rightfully be enforced with violence, even though we're opposed to them. Now, that's better than saying they can be enforced with violence, but that would mean that such preferences or positions would have to fall outside the scope of their political philosophy. They wouldn't belong under the purview of libertarianism. Now, the other issue is that if they do elevate some of these different ideas to the status of rights, like let's say they think people have a right not to be discriminated against based off of their, their race or sex, well, then you can be led to a conflict of rights. And rights are supposed to be inviolable at all places and all times. If two rights have the capacity to be uh, mutually exclusive with one another, then you can tell right off the bat that one of them doesn't belong. All right. Now, this kind of uh, segues into thickism. As I was saying before, Thickism is the idea that libertarianism should include things beyond private property and NAP. Now, I believe Charles Johnson was the person who kind of came up with this idea, and he said there's three different types of thickness. First, there's uh, strategic thickness, which is simply saying that uh, if a certain type of behavior helps bring about a libertarian society, then we should support it. So like if, if being, let's say, not a bigot, like not someone who's racist, being someone who's nice or empathetic, being someone who doesn't judge people simply based off their, their gender or, or sexual orientation or whatever, if that's helpful towards you know, promoting the libertarian message, then that should be part of libertarianism. Then there is also thick, thickism from grounds, which is like if you oppose, uh, I'm sorry, if you oppose aggression, yes, and if you oppose aggression and if you support private property rights, down the if you support anything else on the same grounds that you support those things, that should also be part of libertarianism. So he might say, the reason why I support the NAP is because I oppose oppression, but there are many other things that are also oppressive. So because of that, all things which are oppressive should be also under the umbrella of libertarianism. That's the idea, at least. And then there's a thickness from consequences, which says that any different type of structures which might, which they predict arbitrarily, I should say, to exist in a libertarian society, like, let's say, and this is what they actually believe, let's say they think that most business structures will be very horizontal meaning like co-ops and things of that nature, uh, then that means in our capacity as libertarians, we should also uh, promote co-ops and other horizontal structures. And there is issues here. There are issues here because though these things may or may not be related to libertarianism, being simply related to it doesn't necessarily mean they're a part of it. They, co they collapse relation into identity. And I'll go ahead and quote from Dan Sanchez on this subject. He says that, quote, hardly anybody has ever denied that certain things favor libertarianism, may result from libertarianism, and may share supporting grounds with libertarianism. In fact, recognition of such things has been so prevalent amongst libertarianism that a favorite tactic of thick proponents is to point out such recognitions by their critics and fallaciously proclaim the, their hypocrisy. But of course, seeing a relation, say, between atheism and liberty, in the case of Randians, or conservatism and liberty, in the case of Hans Hermann Hoppe, is not the same thing as accepting the identity of the two related things. And subsuming such related things into the definition of libertarianism is not necessary for recognizing such relations. And he goes on later to say, any concept can be thickened by blurring its boundaries and merging relations into identity with the concept. But the function of terms is to sharpen distinctions, not to blur them. 
A language with fewer distinctions is less, not more useful for theorizing and communicating. Blurring distinctions opens the door to sophistry and sophistry opens the door to the state." End quote. Now here I want to get into more specifically the positions which are explicitly anti-libertarian and anti-ANCAP. So some of the thicker positions we talked about earlier, like oppositions to uh, racism, sexism, and the like, those things we'll say aren't actually components of libertarianism. However, they are definitely compatible with it. There, there's nothing logically incompatible with being a libertarian who also, in addition to being libertarian, is against racism, let's say. But the things we're going to talk about now are things which are actually logically incompatible with the core foundation of uh, anarcho-capitalism and libertarianism, which is the private property ethic. All right. So the first one is occupancy and use norms. Now, these are basically attempts by some of the more mutualist leaning left libertarianisms, uh, libertarians, I should say, to say that, okay, 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 yes, we believe you can own land and, and things of that nature, but there are certain conditions, okay? And they say that there are a few additional positive burdens to actually retain ownership of it. You have to occupy it at a certain frequency or use it in a certain arbitrary way in order to rightfully retain your claim to it. And as ANCAPs were totally against this, we recognize that there may develop different customs uh, that come out organically, uh, which constitute homesteading or constitute uh, a, a proper transfer and title. That's natural, right? Um, different areas might have different customs to what actually constitutes the actual acquisition of property in the first place. But once it's been acquired, once ownership is established, at that point, no additional positive burdens fall on the owner to retain ownership. The only way he can relieve himself of title is if he explicitly revokes it, if he voluntarily trades it away, if he dies without a named heir, or if it's being stripped from him as some form of restitution uh, in response to a previously committed act of aggression on his part, right? But barring those things, there is no reason why there should be any additional positive burdens placed upon him to retain the ownership. And to say that there are is, is to promote an abridgment of private property, which is to promote, promote a substantive deviation from the very core foundation of libertarianism itself. So this is this is actually incompatible with capitalism and libertarianism uh, as we know it. And this is why this should be very much opposed. Um, they also claim to have an opposition to wage labor. Again, keep in mind that some of them might say, well, yeah, we think wage labor is suboptimal, but we want it forced on you. Again, those types, they're not as bad, but you have to know, they have to know that such a preference against wage labor doesn't fall inside the scope of their position, their disposition as a libertarian, because that's a political philosophy. That's something that exists outside that capacity. But for many others, they do think that wage labor is inherently exploitative, that it's inherently a human rights violation of some sort. And to be opposed to wage labor in that capacity is to, is to promote some sort of uh, abridgment to the freedom of contract. Freedom of contract, which is a, a necessary derivative of, of uh, private property to your external goods or to your own body. If you own yourself or if you own your, own your property, you have the right to engage in uh, contractual relationships with other people regarding those things. Uh, with your body, of course, when it comes to labor, you can quit whenever you want. That's fine. No one can have a claim to your body, but you can choose to do with it what you wish. If you want to if you want to work for five dollars an hour uh, making uh, widgets, such as your right. OK, and you can quit whenever you want. Um, they also uh, oppose different types of voluntary hierarchies and bossism. Like I said before, they oppose corporations. They think they are inherently exploitative. And there is a lot of confusion in the libertarian community, not just in the left libertarian community, but in general about the nature of corporations. 
but really there is nothing inherently um, unlibertarian about that firm type corporation as a firm type and if you want to get more into this I encourage you to check out my chapter on corporations again in the book a spontaneous order I'll link that to the show notes um, basically corporations in no way they in no way alleviate anyone of legal accountability for their individual actions and that that's that's the biggest point of contention people don't understand the limited liability aspect of them they're not limiting anyone's liability for their individual actions just keep that in mind and if you want to know more about it just read that chapter um, again they also oppose the uh, landlord lease arrangements and this is owing to their own occupancy and use uh, uh, that's owing to the fact that they like occupancy and use norms we call them ONU norms for short. Uh, they say basically, it, well, if the owner's not using it and the other guy's living in it, well, because he's the one using it, the renter's the one using it, it should be effectively his. And by doing this, they're effectively collapsing possession into ownership for want of a distinction. And these things are distinct because if someone steals your car, well, the thief now possesses your car, but just because he possesses it doesn't mean he's the rightful owner. So we know there's a difference between ownership and possession. You know, there's a distinction there. And again, ownership is the exclusive right to use something. Not, it's not necessarily actual use. It's the right to use, the right to occupy, the exclusive right to employ. And they also may have an opposition to interest-bearing loans. Again, this is an abridgment to uh, freedom of contract, which is ultimately an infringement of people's uh, uh, range of actions what they can do with their private property so it's a private property infringement too which again is the core of libertarianism so these are very anti-libertarian and cap positions this is the stuff they throw upon you after they've sucked you in with their equivocating bullshit up front about how they're just free market guys too they just have bleeding hearts for other things no ultimately it comes down to this agenda which is to kind of stuff and smuggle in some more socialistic bullshit into the uh, lib under the libertarian umbrella and uh, as an as people who value private property who value individual liberty and free markets we need to be keenly aware of this unless we fall prey to this sort of uh, sophistry okay finally these guys are explicitly anti-capitalist and when it comes to this topic, this is where most of the equivocation and Mott and Bailey tactics come into play. Um, what they'll do is they'll criticize capitalism in order to appeal to other lefty friends, other lefty socialists, left-leaning types. But then if you're like a, a person who likes private property and capitalism, and you kind of call them out on this, they'll kind of backpedal with the whole Mott and Bailey thing, and they'll say, oh, well, we're opposed to currently existing capitalism. But when you dig deeper, 90%, 90-95% of the actual specific complaints they have, of the actual attributes they're complaining about of quote-unquote existing capitalism, the elements they're critiquing are socialist elements. They are almost always status interventions. For instance, They'll complain about existing capitalism by talking against uh, IP laws. Well, IP laws uh, limit the range that people can do with their own scarce goods. IP, to try to assert property rights over non-scarce items is a folly because it ultimately, in order to be enforced, requires the infringement of legitimate property rights over scarce goods. So this is something that's a deviation from capitalism. They'll talk about regulatory capture. Again, Regulatory capture is a function that cannot exist without the state. And as insofar as the state exists and provides any regulatory functions whatsoever, this is a departure from capitalism, right? And then, again, like I said earlier, the socializing cost thing. Uh, socializing anything, cost or profits or whatever, it's, so, it's socialist, okay? Which is the antithesis of capitalism because it always involves an abridgment of private property rights. So again, these guys, as much as they hate binaries when it comes to gender, they can't seem to get out of the binary perspective when it comes to economies. They're, never, they're almost never binary. 
all economies fall on a spectrum between socialism and capitalism, with communism being the end point on the socialist side and anarcho-capitalism being the end point on the capitalist side. And just because our economy at this point in America may fall closer to the capitalist end of the spectrum than the socialist end of the spectrum, it does not follow from that that every element of our economy is therefore capitalist. No, if every element were capitalist, we'd be on the anarcho-capitalist end point. All right, now there are three different types of reasons they oppose capitalism. Uh, strategic reasons and they'll say well uh, capitalism has a lot of baggage it's got a pretty bad stigma so we don't like to use it because we want to scare people off yet the irony is that these people are explicitly anarchist leftist and socialist a lot of times or mutualist like they're okay with the term socialism they're very friendly but in fact like Sheldon Richman for instance he likes to think of himself as a free market socialist and terms like socialist and leftist and anarchist, they have at least just as much stigma and baggage as capitalism. So you can tell that's kind of a disingenuous reason that they're putting out there to be uh, opposed to its use. As far as semantic is concerned, we've kind of already gone over that with the existing capitalism bullshit excuse. And of course, when you get behind all their bullshit reasons being plastic, which is the strategic semantic reasons, you get down, to, there's actually do exist substantive disagreements with capitalism as it's properly defined. Again, remember, capitalism is just um, referring to that environment to where there is a systematic or institutional respect for private property over the means of production. That's all it is. That's all it is. That's all it is. So when they talk about ONU norms, opposition to wage labor, opposition to voluntary hierarchies like uh, corporations and such, op opposition to renting, opposition to interest-bearing loans, etc., these are all actually substantive oppositions to capitalism. They're not just the same as you are with some semantic differences. There's some real differences here that you need to be aware of with these people. There's a reason why their slogan is free market anti-capitalism. They're, they're really trying to pervert pervert the language here. They're trying to use and play a lot of sophistry to smuggle in these socialist ideas. And we need to be very wary of this. Now, in conclusion, there are a lot of things that we hold in common. We're all anti-war. We all want to see the state go away. This is good. But we need to be keenly aware of our differences. And we need to understand when they hold these ideas, which are explicitly logically incompatible with the core foundation of libertarianism as we know it, at least as anarcho-capitalists, we need to know that this is not infighting. They are not in to begin with. They're in a separate category altogether. So when they call themselves left libertarians, this is really a misnomer. Okay? So just be aware of that. It's okay to ally, like to uh, fight for common causes together and to have empathy for one another. This isn't necessarily an attack on left libertarians, but I do want to reveal the true nature of left libertarianism as a philosophy, a political philosophy. Okay, guys, I really hope you enjoyed this presentation as much as I liked making it. Uh, if you want to see more videos like this, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. It's youtube.com slash ancapchase. If you want to help me increase the production value of my videos or uh, just help me out personally, you can always donate to me at tinyurl.com slash donateandcapchase. Or you can make an Amazon purchase of my book, A Spontaneous Order, if you kind of want to get more into the weeds of some of the various things I touched upon today. All right, guys, thanks again for stopping by, and I hope you have a pleasant rest of the day.